had a, a wonderful day so far with uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh, topics. Uh, it seems that uh, climate change is uh, one of of the um, great issues of uh, sustainability, and uh, we actually have uh, ready our next speaker uh, from uh, London, UK. Uh, Global Sustain has entered uh, a strategic partnership uh, with uh, Carbon Trade Exchange. And uh, we have the honor of having uh, the founder and CEO uh, online with us today, uh, Wayne Sharp. Uh, briefly, before I give uh, the, the, the digital form to uh, Wayne, um, I'd like to share a couple of uh, interesting uh, uh, developments. Um, we have uh, decided something like uh, four or five years ago as Global Sustain uh, to become a, a carbon neutral company. Uh, we hadn't like uh, ever um, imagined what this would take. Uh, it's a very uh, difficult uh, venture, uh, challenging uh, to actually uh, become carbon neutral. Uh, now all our businesses, all our operations uh, are carbon neutral. And as uh, also this uh, event is carbon neutral. Uh, we so in, uh, in, in, in other terms, in simple language, what we actually do is measure the CO2 emissions. As I said briefly in my presentation um, uh, uh, the, in the first half of uh, this uh, forum, um, the EU Green Deal uh, says that Europe must be carbon neutral by 2050. This means that each and every one of us needs to assume the uh, responsibility and measure the CO2 footprint. CO2 footprint can uh, come uh, from uh, several uh, operations and angles and aspects. Uh, we make sure that uh, Wayne touches upon these uh, issues. And actually, a whole market, like a financial market, has developed around this uh, industry, right? The carbon industry. Uh, we've seen also from other investors that uh, uh, carbon uh, is uh, one of uh, the topics and issues that exclude uh, from uh, their um, uh, the, their investments and also from uh, banking operations. Uh, so what we want to see is how this all can be done in a platform. That's what Wayne is going to show us. Uh, Wayne is a veteran in the financial and credit markets and capital markets. And uh, he also wants to uh, share with us his, uh, br briefly his history of how being uh, coming from um, uh, entrepreneurship uh, wants to bridge the financial and banking and the business world uh, through some through an exchange platform and uh, actually the european commission enables such platforms and uh, businesses in order to make this in a more transparent and credible way uh, uh, global has sustained has envisioned this uh, 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 transition to this economy so we are making sure that every year not only do we measure our carbon emissions, but we also make uh, efforts to minimize the impact. And of course, there is impact that we cannot avoid. Everyone has a carbon footprint. But at the very, very end, how do you offset this impact? And this is exactly uh, what uh, Wayne is going to um, uh, tell us. And last but not least, uh, we're going to have uh, two uh, representatives from uh, the EBRD, from the European Bank for Reconstruction Development, right after a 30-minute speech by Wayne Sharp, who can actually say that they invest in companies and banks and private equity funds based on such criteria, right? So uh, it becomes evident that not only investors, banks, and uh, funds, but also consideration okay so without any uh, further delay uh, i would like to ask if wayne is with us wayne can you hear us yes i can great uh wayne thank you so much for being with us uh, i know you were supposed to come live in athens but <laughs> COVID has kept you away uh, we hope to be able to uh, welcome you uh, at some of your uh, future trips and enjoy you live uh, here. Uh, the digital floor is yours, Wayne. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I thought I'd just start very briefly. I know that you're just looking at a, at a screen of our company logo, but I'll just give you a very brief background. Uh, uh, basically, I founded a company called Bartercard back in 1991, pre the internet. Uh, we were the, became the world's largest business to business exchange for goods and services credits. Uh, during the time that I ran that company as CEO and founder and, and majority shareholder, we turned over in excess of $40 billion. Uh, we had uh, uh, well in excess of 500,000 businesses around the world who were clients of ours. We had 136 offices in 20 countries. The bottom line is that uh, when I came across the issues of, of climate change, what I realised is that there was a great lack of entrepreneurial leadership in this sector. There were a lot of people who wanted to run around hugging trees, but there was a big disconnect between the people who were hugging the trees and doing the projects on the ground and the financial sector. Uh, the first uh, carbon expo that I went to was reminded me a little bit of a, a medieval market with everyone bringing their chickens and goats along. And the reality is that, that I realise without technology, we cannot possibly achieve the outcomes required to stop irreversible climate change and possibly the destruction of humankind. So I decided to sell my company to management. It was funded by a major Australian bank uh, management buyout so that I could focus on the project that you're seeing today. We've been operating over 10 years and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we believe and why we believe sustainability and 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 both the ESGs and the, and 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 the sustainable development goals are critical that we must deliver outcomes not just do reporting reporting is great having ambitions is great but we want to talk about how you can deliver an actual outcome that matters um so let me just see if my my thing will actually okay so look i think the first thing is we all know that 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 climate change is everybody's problem uh the the greenhouse gas emissions are, are escalating uh, they're still increasing exponentially. For those who don't know anything about fracking, the, the power, the, the the forcing factor of methane is astronomically higher, thirty to eighty times higher than than uh, than CO two, uh, and that's going on all over the world, uh, and all the impacts are already being felt. The bottom line is that with all of the the negative impacts that we can see that are happening in the world today. It's, it's become increasingly obvious that we need to take action. And all the, all the signatories to the Paris Agreement have said that they will take action. Now, that's 200 signatories, which includes all of the EU countries. So we're talking about, you know, over 210 uh, countries that have signed a commitment to do something about it in terms of regulation. The business opportunities are real because there's a market liberal, liberalisation, there's financial institutions now looking to fund projects that are going to originate carbon credits, there's opportunities for companies to participate in, in a very positive way as either a buyer or as a seller or as a project originator or a financier. The bottom line is that, that, that what's going to happen is that many of the countries that were signatories to the uh, uh, original uh, programs uh, before the Paris Agreement, okay, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, basically they are no longer going to sell credits into the international markets. So people like China are not going to sell those credits into the markets anymore. That means there's a huge opportunity for other countries to enter these markets. And countries and country, companies are facing unique risks. Investors are, are aware of this now, and hundreds of billions of dollars have been dedicated to this. How big is this business opportunity? Well, look, the World Bank commits $50 billion for climate adaption and re resilience. In conjunction with the IFC, they have actually committed $200 billion over the next decade towards these projects. The UN Environment Program says 130 banks with 47 trillion in assets have committed to responsible investment principles. What we'll talk today is how to talk those commitments from being just talking about it to action. Green bonds last year was $255 billion industry, and only 39% of businesses think they're taking enough action on sustainable development goals, even though the many medium to smaller companies don't even really know what those mean necessarily entirely yet. 
But carbon footprinting and reporting is, is becoming mandatory for medium to large companies and all listed companies around the world. And greenwashing is being outed. Consumers and investors are really starting to realise the difference between people saying they're doing something and actually doing something. So what is Carbon Trade Exchange all about? Well, what we're, what we're looking to do is to make sure that, that, that we are going to change the dynamics and provide the technology infrastructure between Carbon Trade Exchange and its parent company, Global Environmental Markets, uh, into redefine into a, 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 a clean, green future. The Carbon Trade Exchange platform is designed to be secure, simple and transparent. Open transparent pricing so that everyone knows what they're buying in a wholesale market, like a stock exchange. Uh, okay. Uh, so this was founded in uh, in um, uh, in 2007. I, I, I started to realise that we needed to do this, uh, this particular program. Uh, we've done over $100 million in credits. So I apologise. I just realised I hadn't turned my phone off. <laughs> Big trap for young players, um, and and in 2010 I established a parent company because we started to build other uh, technology solutions and other exchange platforms. We have built exchanges and and trading platforms for markets: the EU ETS, Californian market, the Reggie market uh, in uh, northeastern USA, the Australian carbon market, renewable energy certificates market, and during that whole time, however. Uh, uh, the, the, we we had Carbon Trade Exchange operating 24-7, 365 days a year. This photo in the bottom right-hand corner is the former Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, who asked to have that photo taken at Carbon Trade Exchange at the Australian Carbon Expo, which unfortunately doesn't occur anymore. Um, so... CTX business activity is to facilitate the buying and selling of carbon credits in the voluntary market. We're using the three major uh, international recognised credit standards. These are all high quality standards with verified emission offset uh, uh, outcomes. So we trade things that have happened already, not hypothetical, not futures, not something that might happen, you know, 20 or 30 years down the track. I have to tell you, when I heard about this this business of people saying, you know, we want to be carbon zero by 2050, I mean, give me a break. The people making these these sort of commitments, who are they fooling? They'll be retired or dead by the time 2050 comes around. So who cares what they say today? They'll, they'll have no responsibility for that. We need action today, not 20 or 30 years from today. Carbon credits, what's it all about? It's a unit of measurement. It was designed by the Carter Protocol. One tonne of CO2 or a CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gases. There are multiple greenhouse gases with different forcing agents. Uh, 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 the, the, the CO2 equivalent tonne of CO2 is worth one carbon credit, which is a carbon car a tonne of CO2 or equivalent gas that's either been not emitted in the production of renewable energy, for example, or sequestered and taken out of the atmosphere, which could be land-based or it could be something like methane capture uh, to energy and things like this. The whole idea of this is to be able to finance developing countries and even some semi-developed countries to fund projects so the whole idea is this is their, their financial subsidy. Fossil fuels get trillions of dollars in subsidies every year. This is the financial subsidy that goes to the carbon projects that are trying to actually make a difference to the future of this planet. What we say is a little different to what many companies say that are in the measurement space. And what we're saying is what you should do is measure your carbon footprint, and by the way, we have relationships with companies that can help you do that, technology solutions that are scalable at, at enterprise level. Uh, they should then offset their emission footprint to price carbon within the business or within the portfolio of, of investments in the case of a financial institution. And then they should plan their carbon reduction program around the pricing within their carbon, uh, uh, within the price of carbon within their business. So they'll have a sectoral uh, uh, pricing and then they can communicate what they've done as Michael just did to you. And then what they should do is repeat the whole process cycle again and keep looking to reduce their emission footprint 
and keep working to make sure that the companies they're engaged with, their supply chain, everyone else, takes it on board as well. Excuse me. So the three credit registry standards that we trade are the highest credit standards in the world. Uh, these are the global benchmarks for carbon uh, emission footprints. The United Nations, UNFCCC, we signed the first commercial uh, agreement that they'd ever had. And I didn't know that until the guy who signed it announced it at, uh, at, the, uh, at the Carbon uh, Innovate for Climate Conference in Barcelona on the stage. And he said that, and I went, wow, and everyone else went, wow. So we are pretty proud of that. Gold standard, verified carbon standard, and these are measure and verify contributions to a minimum, a minimum of three sustainable development goals. And I think this is an important point. What we want to be able to do is show how carbon offsetting also enhances your sustainability message and your outcomes. So we've had over 11 years of experience. Over the past decade, we've had 850 projects listed on the exchange. Not all of them are listed at any one time, of course. We've traded over 100 million tonnes. Uh, you know, it, it, I think the story speaks for itself. We trade in multiple currencies. We have a continuous trading contract. There's no paperwork required and a transaction log. And buyers don't even have to have a registry account. If they don't really want one, we will do the retirements on their behalf. And what that means is that when, when you, if you're a member on the exchange, you can actually search for the products. You have an index, like a stock exchange index. You know what your cash balance is. You know what, what project you're looking for, what vintage, what standard, what project type, what region it's from, what country it's from, and what price you're going to pay. There are no secrets, and when you click on the information button, it takes you directly to the registry and the original documents that are used to certify and verify those projects. So if and when you get in, go ahead and buy them online, it's an immediate T plus zero transaction, and you can then take those documents that you looked at and use those for your marketing or brand awareness and also to support your statements in your sustainability reports. So retirement, in order to make a carbon credit an offset, you have to cancel it or retire it. And that means that the, the, the once they're retired or cancelled, they can't be bought or sold by anybody else. They can't be used again. So they've been expunged, and that is how you've negated your environmental footprint uh, uh, on the planet because someone else has done something positive and you're giving them a subsidy for having done so. Oops, sorry. Um, so... All of these, all of these retirements have a public record, uh, and the public record differs. Uh, gold standard, uh, CERs, we, we give you a certificate. Um, we do have a facility where we can produce certificates for anyone if they really want one, uh, but this is the one that's produced by the UNFCCC. Uh, all of these, all of these project types, all have different methods of recording, but all of them in their registry have a permanent record. Our system has no uh, counterparty risk. So again, what we're trying to do is look at, I looked at this system from the point of view of the financial services sector and the business sector and said, what I need to be able to do is remove the risk and make it easy to do. Because if it's easy to do, maybe more people will do it. So we, we the, the, the credits are escrowed, they can't be sold anywhere else, which means when you buy the credits, they can't not be delivered. And the, the uh, buyer is in funds, so for a project, they have no risk because the, cr the money is already sitting in our escrow account and they can only purchase with funds they've got at their disposal. Well, where is the future going? Look, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, only 22% is currently covered by, by uh, emission programs, but there's, and, and so far, uh, $45 billion has gone into 14,500 registered projects. This is nowhere near big enough, ladies and gentlemen. We need much more. At this stage, I can tell you there are people who say that the, the, the two-degree goal that for the set by the Paris Agreement has already been passed, mainly thanks to fracking. So the reality is that unless we take dramatic action as business people and financial people and start to drive this forward, and this is not, we're not talking about a big cost here. 
I can tell you that every company that we've ever done this for, we're talking about a fraction of a percent of their profits that it would cost them to be carbon neutral. So we're not talking about big money if you're dealing on a wholesale marketplace. And the technology to, to measure these carbon footprints and even your whole corporate sustainability, again, is non expensive thing, right? Uh, we also have, have under the new under the Paris Agreement, there'll be a new credit type, which is called an ITMO. Uh, only the UN could come up with this acronym: Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcome. <laughs> Who made that up? Anyway, the 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 we have developed an ITMO registry, which we are now selling to developing and uh, and small island nations and any any country that would like to have it. In fact, one of the things I was going to be doing, even though we know Greece is a developed nation, is to be talking to the Greek government about providing them with a registry for this exact purpose, because that registry can house all of their emission reduction activity in that country and also provide for the export of carbon credits for the developed countries to buy them, which is how they will subsidise wherever they can't reduce their emissions. Also, you uh, many of you are probably aware of the airlines. Now, I, I see the airline program as a bit of a greenwashing exercise, frankly. However, having said that, we have set up a, a aviation carbon exchange technology solution. We are we have the Corsia, which is the regulatory requirements. Uh, Corsia approved credits symbol on the exchange, so people know what they're buying at all times. And this is, I think, the critical thing. If you're, if you're someone who's in the sustainability section, I don't think you really want to become an expert in carbon markets. What you really want to be able to do is prove that you can deliver the outcomes that your company or your board or your shareholders and your ex uh, are setting as expectations. And that's what we want to try and help you deliver. Now, obviously, what are your business drivers? I mean, you have an environmental sustainability goal and a carbon management strategy, perhaps, and if you don't, you should have one, okay? So what you're really trying to do is get some market differentiation. You're trying to create a PR opportunity because you want to, you know, it's still a commercial enterprise. You're not all out there just wanting to hug trees and, you know, worry about how clean the water is. You want to, yes, you might want to do that, but the reality is you've got a business to run. That means you've got to do it in a commercially viable manner, an economical manner within a budget, and also be able to propagate the message so that people can see you're doing well and help your business improve. The bottom line is that it helps your employ uh, corporate reputation, helps employee engagement, you get ahead of legislation. If you are legislated, then obviously we can help you immediately. But if you're not, trust me, there's a very strong chance that you will be at some time in the foreseeable future. You get more operational efficiency and increased revenue. And more importantly, you'll help your bottom line. And this is what business has really got to be all about, as we know. Now, if you can get a better outcome socially, environmentally and financially, I fa fail to see how that's not knocking your, your job right out of the park in terms of positive. Here's a great example that I love. Now, I was at, uh, at uh, the uh, COP, uh, Conference of the Parties, which is the UN Climate Change Conference. Uh, one of the many that I went to was in Copenhagen, uh, which was in 2009. And uh, Copenhagen at that point was supposed to be the new banner one. In fact, all the all the, the, the leaders came along to it and the whole thing fizzled, unfortunately. Bottom line is I went to a World Bank event and, and everyone there except me was a banker. They were CEOs and CFOs of major banks, 20-something banks from across Europe and maybe other parts of the world, I don't know for sure. The bottom line is Danske Bank did this presentation and you could have heard a pin drop when they presented these results then. Now it's even more astounding. It's, they decided to go carbon neutral in 2007. It cost them 500000 Now that's a lot of money. They shouldn't have paid that much, but some broker stitched them up, obviously. But 2009, their carbon footprint had reduced by 40% and they had 1.5 million euros per year of permanent savings because they priced carbon within their business. Since then, their reductions have gone from back then was 115,000 tonnes in 2007. It's now 15,000 tonne, their emission footprint. It's a 73% reduction. 
their offsetting cost is less than 50,000 euros now. So it's a 90% reduction in cost. Since then, they've expanded by over 100 branches as well while, while doing this reduction. They've reduced emission footprint and costs across multiple sectors. All the things that were high emission footprint were also wastage and high cost or things that they could focus on. They've reduced staff numbers by 2,000. Well, maybe that's not the greatest part of the story, but that's natural attrition. They haven't sacked anybody. But they've had total permanent savings of over 20 million euros because they went carbon neutral first and then started reducing their emission footprint. And I'll tell you, we haven't looked hard at their sustainability statement, but I bet you if they drill down into it or when they do use our technology, what will happen is we will have the, the, the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, the numerics of those will be available on the exchange in the very near future. So look, obviously we, what, what the, the reason we're here, of course, is not just because we love the world, but also we're a commercial animal. We are offering Global Sustain members a 50% discount on CTX membership fees in case that's of any interest. But if not, what I will say is this, it doesn't matter whether you're using Carbon Trade Exchange or somebody else. What the most important thing that you need to do, in my opinion, is make sure that your corporate sustainability goals your ESGs, your sustainable development goals, whatever you want to call them, really need to be real. They need to be deliverable, right? And the bottom line is that if, if we all start focusing our resources on this, then this will drive the amount of money that's needed into this sector so that we have a realistic, genuine chance, genuine chance of reversing catastrophic climate change. Now, if you haven't read, there's a book sitting up there behind me called The Economics of Climate Change. And this was written for the, for, the, for, the, for the UK government. And it's a nice, nice, meaty little document, as you can see. Having read this, you realise, and this was written back in 2006, six seven, something like that, uh, that you realise that this, uh, this is such a serious matter He's talking about there, based on the numbers we had then, that the economic impact will be the equivalent of both the, the, both of the, the Great Depressions, but, sorry, both World Wars and the Great Depression combined. The cost of mitigating this is small today, but it won't become, it'll get larger and larger and the impact will get worse and worse. So there's no question in my mind that we must act and we must take what we say and turn it into what we do. So having said that, I'll, I'll be very happy to hand over, Michael. I don't, I haven't, wasn't able to attend this morning. I apologise. So I'm un, I, I, unaware as to whether or not we can take questions or not. If so, I'm happy to do so. Uh, Wayne, can you hear me? I can indeed. Wayne? Yes, I can. Thank you very, very much for your passionate presentation and uh, speech. I hope uh, participants can, can realize how passionate you are about uh, this uh, market. And uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's a very interesting book by Nicholas Stern. And uh, you know, you already know perhaps that uh, also the Bank of Greece, uh, the, the Greek legislator for the banking financial system has produced uh, an, uh, a report on the impact of climate change in the country. And uh, I know that uh, you've been in discussions with the Greek government yes. uh, lately. And so perhaps you want to give us a flavor of what you've been discussing uh, for this part of the world? Sure. Well, look, uh, uh, what I pointed out was that the, the registry technology is designed to record all of the emission outcomes you have within any nation. And that could include anything from a renewable energy certificates or guarantees of origin, as some countries call them. Uh, a voluntary program, a regulated compliance program, allowances, or uh, uh, carbon credits, which could include ITMOs, which would be transferable within countries. Now, obviously, the ITMO production process at this stage, the assumption is, of course, that, that a country like Greece would, would not qualify to export to tell them to a, another international developed nation. However, that doesn't mean they couldn't be transferred within the EU for other countries within the EU that aren't meeting their 
portion of the EU NDC. So there are lots of ways that a technology solution can help with that. And obviously, one of the key things we were hoping to achieve, and I hope I will achieve when I do come down there in two or three weeks' time, is look to work out how we can maximise the carbon origination and provide the commercial output for it. Now, in our case, you know, I, I realise that that the technology, we had to drive it tech-wise because you can't have the, the, the silly system that's been operating in the environment, uh, carbon markets for the last you know, 15 years where people are sending pieces of paper and signing them to each other and all this sort of rubbish. I mean, we can't get the scale with you doing that. We've got to have technological outcomes. The Greek government is very engaged with that. Uh, and I met uh, the, the senior person out of the Parliamentary Commission uh, uh, at the COP25 in, in Madrid, um, and we had extensive discussions about how I could work with the, with the Greek government to try and assist there. But, you know, we, we, we're, I have to say, quite agnostic when it comes to which country we're going to help. The bottom line is we're going to, obviously, we're in business as well, so we've got to go for the low-hanging fruit, like you all should, which means you've got to go to the places that, want to be helped, not try and shove it down the throats of people who don't want to be helped. Yeah. So another another question that I have is like uh, many, many businesses in, in a country, and let's take Greece, for example, uh, want to uh, put their projects and sell the credits into a platform like yours. Like yes. Instead of, instead, instead of like buying and selling credits for some projects that are not even in Greece. And they say, why shall we like offset our CO2 emissions by doing a, a project in Vietnam or Panama or whatever, instead yes. of like, if they like supporting something that's local and how can we do that? Is that, is that possible through your uh, technologies and your, and your markets? Well, first of all, technically it is. The rules on whether what credits you can or can't produce are generally set by government. So really that comes down to working with the financial community and the government to try and make sure that we get the, the processes in place that allow that export of credits to take place. Uh, so, for example, in the UK, you can't export a credit. Everything that happens in the UK accredits back to the to the central government. So therefore, there's no opportunity for real credit origination, which is why the only thing they're doing is these things called regos, which is a renewable energy certificate. And they tried to start a forestry project and it was complete failure because everything is done on the future planning of trees. So you can buy a, a carbon credit futures for a forestry credit for 2042. I mean, why the hell would anyone want to do that? You know, the tree hasn't even grown yet. So, so at this stage, obviously, there's there's a, a bit of system design that needs to happen at the government level in order to maximise the opportunity for projects. That was part of the reason for coming down there to talk to them because we have the technical infrastructure and we can have it produce and manage and sell credits of any kind. And there's nothing to stop uh, uh, the government from meeting its emission reduction targets by having a, a, a domestic uh, credit unit program that can be have projects producing credits in Greece that can be sold to companies in Greece, as an example, or other com com companies in the EU. So, you know, one of the things we had uh, uh, we were working on uh, earlier this year until the whole COVID thing started was a, 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 a Spanish northern uh, in the northern part of Spain a forestry uh, credit standard that they wanted to do with the with the, the the regional government in Spain to sell those credits first of all to other Spanish companies and then ultimately throughout the EU. So there's no reason why the Greek Greek, Greek uh, uh, economy couldn't be doing exactly the same thing. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, last but not least, uh, there's another question here. Uh, the EU has made a very bold commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050, and this is actually one of your uh, parts of yeah. your presentation, carbon neutrality. Do you see this feasible? They also committed like... A, one trillion, they say the, the sustainable investment needs to be. Is it uh, too ambitious? You think it may even happen earlier or or later? What what, what do you think? Well, first of all, I'm I, I I I'm I really detest this 2050 rubbish. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the people making these commitments, how old are they? They're 50. 
they'll be dead, right? So you know what, they don't care really. I mean, it's just it's just a, it's like a like a little headline. It's not real. Okay, if you want to set a real target, you've got to set a heavy target, and you've got to set it in a short term, right? You know, carbon neutrality can be achieved much more rapidly if you drive the sector, which means you drive the economy and you drive finance into the sector that's going to help achieve it. I mean, and, and the smaller the nation, the easier that would be. In the, in the terms of the whole of the EU, yes, it's an ambitious target, but the time frame is idiotic in my view. It needs to be something for a decade from now. In case we all forgot, okay, we actually had this crazy targets about 12, 14 years ago which were for 2020, and all of a sudden that was the big crisis point. Now they've pushed it to 2050 because people are too gutless to take action. So the, the, the realist, realism thing is this. In business, you don't have to wait for government to tell you what to do. You decide what you're going to do. All right. Well, well fair enough. Well, uh, let's hope that we'll be around to see if this target is met in 2050. Well, let's, uh, hope, let's hope they bring it to 2030 and still achieve it. <laughs> yes, that would be even better. Dane, thank you so much for your presentation and your time. I really appreciate your engagement. All right, hopefully we'll have you soon here in Athens. Matt, I'll be down there very soon. I look forward to uh, sharing a glass of wine and more importantly, getting some productive outcomes in the, in the local, local economy down there. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.